Mega Man X6 released in 2001 to roughly average reviews from critics, and it seemed that they weren't the only ones getting tired of the same blue bomber formula over in Japan. The crux of the notion was fairly ubiquitous, that the Mega Man formula had become boring and the series needs to move on from these stale 2D environments and embrace the next generation of graphics, a criticism the series had constantly received since it first landed on the PS1 back in 1997. Even though Mega Man Legends did the same thing in the same year, but people didn't care about that one because that was a new sub-series, alright, that's off topic. But now these six years later in 2003, Capcom figured it was time to give the Mega Man X series that big break. That's what they were hoping for anyway. Capcom decided to put Capcom Studio Production 3 up to the task, the studio behind Resident Evil 2, Gregory Horror Show, and Disney's Magical Quest starring Mickey and Minnie for the Game Boy Advance. That, that's a weird one. Yes, the studio responsible for a handful of 3D horror games were put in charge of the next mainline entry for the Mega Man X series, presumably because they had some kind of experience when it came to 3D games for the company, a fundamental red flag planted from the beginning for sure. Not to say that I have anything against Resident Evil, not in the slightest, but these are <laughs> very different games. I don't think that needs explaining. Tatsuya Kitabayashi, the man behind Resi 1 Remake, Resi 0, Breath of Fire 3 and 4, and another goddamn Disney game for the GameCube, would be taking the reins for this game, with Inafune once again taking a backseat, only offering feedback and criticisms in regard to new Reploids designed for the game, one of which being the big newcomer to the Maverick Hunter crew, Axel, specifically constructed with complex designs that would specifically benefit from this three-dimensional world they put together. The team still consisted of roughly 30 people who funneled most of their available man hours into making sure that the 3D looks right rather than tuning the gameplay. And I mean, even in 2003, this isn't even close to the best graphics that the PS2 could offer. I'm not gonna say it looks bad, but it's definitely a sign of budget issues. This game looks and feels very rushed. Even the planned and cut two-player co-op mode couldn't have saved this game in the condition that it shipped in. It seemed like the team completely missed the point as to why a 3D entry in the X series was asked about for so long. People didn't want Mega Man to play it safe with a 3D coat of paint. They wanted something that felt new. But what we got was a game that arguably played it safer to the brand than X6 did with its story and level-to-level -level structure. Even the newly added 3D camera sections, a marketable selling point for X7, felt like a last-minute addition, even if it wasn't. It just felt that tacked on. Nothing stopped the player from simply moving around some of these enemies that were clearly designed for a 2D camera in mind, attacking in a straight line as if they solely existed on that 2D plane. And the few enemies that were designed for this new perspective were hastily given low effort animations and attacks that simply didn't help the team's case. Even Inafune suggested that they just stick to the 2D plane and try not to overreach, but I mean, they didn't listen. To make things even worse, the promotional material shown for the game only raised more eyebrows. A first look at the game courtesy of Game Now magazine took the time to celebrate how far the series had come to this point, and despite the new player character Axel being shown at the top of the magazine, many were quick to see X himself back in the classic highway sections from X1, firing at the very same B-Blader copter minibosses. It's not at all far-fetched that some would see this and assume that X7 is some sort of soft reboot to the series, if not a full-on reimagining with extra steps akin to 2020's Final Fantasy VII Remake. Stages in this press demo seem to have been more objective-based rather than being a traditional Mega Man stage. Though this could have been a decision made purely for this respective demo, I can't find anything saying otherwise, though. Objectives like destroying 30 enemies in a 5-minute time limit, or rescuing 16 Reploids before the end of the level, concepts that were used in the game, but only in specific arenas that wouldn't let you move on without it. It was a part of the level, not the primary objective, with the exception of the game's one ride chaser mission which is inherently a gimmick on its own. Regardless of all of the red flags erected by everything we knew about the game leading up to this, the game still sold about the same, hitting 110,000 units sold over in Japan over the next five months, a majority of those sales coming in just the first couple weeks. Everyone was stoked to get their hands on that new 3D Mega Man X game, and after the general consensus was out, sales slowed down to a halt, understandably. <laughs> The game was still praised for its character swapping mechanic returning from Extreme 2 and the updated parts system, but everything else was universally bashed, frequently compared by critics to the 3D Castlevania games for the Nintendo 64, though I personally wouldn't go that far. Reviewers back in 2003 begged the average player to swap the dialogue over to Japanese, though for English speakers this option was only available in the US, though setting it to Japanese was merely cosmetic and didn't incorporate the technical differences between the Western and Japanese releases. For me though, a barely cognizant child in the early 2000s 
thousands. By the way, this merch is available in the description down below. Use code YEAR4 for a discount. I was as excited as I could be for a game that I only learned existed when I visited Blockbuster one summer day. And even then, that feeling of excitement was squandered when I put it into the family's PlayStation 2 and found out that the disc was scratched. All I could see was that opening cutscene, which I would watch on repeat because I had nothing better to do. I wouldn't be able to play the game for what felt like an eternity later, which at that age was probably closer to a couple of weeks, and even then remained in denial at how much I enjoyed the game. Unlike X6, where I loved the game to death and nearly beat it in that denial, I don't think I was able to beat a single Maverick in X7. And that's because this game is fucking slow. Enemies have damage and health values that feel like they belong in an MMO with how spongy they are, and boss fights feel like they can last forever if you're not upgraded enough. But if you're patient enough to beat the game and try it again on New Game Plus, it actually feels like a palatable Mega Man game. Not a very good one, but certainly tolerable. Leading me to feel like they specifically nerfed the player and forced you to earn back that initial speed and damage by upgrading themselves, rather than the upgrades building off of what's already there. This problem is less rampant for the Japanese release. For whatever reason, this version of the game gives the player higher damage values. It's like the Western release is just locked into a permanent hard mode. A reverse Mega Man 2. I wouldn't replay the game until middle school when I downloaded it off of some shady website for the PC, a port exclusively released in South Korea. It was one of those games where the game speed was tied to your CPU so it just ran super fucking fast. I wouldn't have the chance to give it a proper look until the modern X Legacy collections released, and even then I wouldn't play it in full until practicing for that big Mega Man X series race I had with creators and friends of the show Jay's Reviews and Retropolis Zone, where despite the game being as slow as it is, I felt it was pretty straightforward and I didn't come remotely close to hating it as much as I do with X6. But how does it hold up when shoved under that analytical microscope that I like to put these games under? Zero. You're my hero! The answer is not very well. Our game begins with an improperly aligned background image. This is an official re-release that has been upscaled, so this white line really shouldn't fucking be here at this point. X7 continues the series trend of title screens that just don't make any sense to the game. I mean, we've got Axel in the back, that's pretty cool. But I don't I don't get the Matrix text in the background. I know that X6 opened with some Matrixy transcript looking stuff, but that that's really all I've got. Though I do like the new logo, going back to that classic Mega Man logo look rather than the PS1 Trilogy X logo. This game was going to have a logo similar to the PS1 Trilogy, but at some point someone thought, hey, what if we did this instead? And I give them credit, it looks pretty good, which is gonna be a bit of a recurring theme in this game. Some moments that aesthetically look pretty good. And then, you know, the execution of the rest of the game just... <laughs> We're gonna be playing this on hard mode because literally nothing is different aside from a couple of bosses having more health. I'm also turning on auto fire because A, it's provided as a setting in the base game and I'm not using external hardware for it, and B, I, I really don't care. It barely speeds up the pace of the game and will save my thumbs the pain they'll adore if I mashed manually, because we're gonna be doing a lot of single pellet button mashing in this game. Don't worry, this won't be the case for every Mega Man game I review, only the ones with horrendous pacing. Our story opens with what I believe to be a black market deal going south. Two reploids, one with a limp that I can only imagine was created from the get-go to have a limp and require a cane, who's betrayed by his partner in crime who turns out to be Axel, who presumably killed his partner off-screen, a shape-shifting reploid working for Red Alert. And he is really all that matters here in this opening cinematic, literally none of this is relevant to the story beyond this point. The year is, of course, 21XX. Society is still finding its footing after the Eurasia incident, though for whatever reason, Maverick crime continues to rise. This is a Mega Man X game, of course, and after six games of this, eight if you count the extreme games, I'm starting to think that this is just the norm for this universe. Though with X stepping down as leader of the Maverick Hunters, saying that he's tired of all the endless fighting, even though that's exactly what he said he would do at the end of X1, the Maverick policing has come to a bit of a standstill, with Red Alert taking up the slack. Except, you know, they're obviously the bad guys here so they have some kind of malicious intent, which is ironic because they actually capture their mavericks instead of killing them. Whatever, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. You know, it would make sense if he stepped down because he wanted to rehabilitate the mavericks they capture rather than just killing them, but this game doesn't really have a story. X is still obviously playable in this game, we just don't unlock him for a while. You know, unlock him in a game where his name is in the title. After that cinematic though, Axel renounces his alliance to Red Alert, deciding to go freelance for the time being, and that's what leads us to the opening mission. Red all right, seems easy enough. Just shoot the main laser to shut them off. 
Oh, oh, I don't need to aim. It's one thing if this auto aim feature was optional, but it, it's not. The hint system returns from X5, thankfully being optional like it was in X6, though it is a Mega Man game in the early 2000s, so it is of course going to have some translation issues. Take out the main security laser, Axel monologues to himself when there is no main security laser. Axel is capable of hovering from the get-go by holding down the jump button, and you're able to adjust your movement in the air without immediately dropping like a rock, like in X4's force, force armor. Gameplay, though, still feels stiff. Even in these 2D segments, it feels like you're running through waist-high water, and wall jumping just feels off. It locks you into this dedicated arc away from the wall, which the classic games did too, but it was much less noticeable and way less restricting. The previous X games were able to nail this feeling down to a T, and translating this into 3D with a pretty incompetent team, it it's night and day, and when you can't nail down one of the biggest things that set the X series apart from the classic series, uh, that's, that's really not a good sign. Transitioning to the game's selling point of traversing a 3D space again feels not too different from navigating a 2D space, which I guess isn't not a compliment. You don't need to relearn mechanics because they're pretty consistent between the 2D and 3D cameras. It still feels like Molasses Mega Man, just this time I can navigate through the Y axis. We are also introduced to Axel's A-Trans ability, used by charging up your special weapon when you don't have one equipped. It is pretty fucking stupid because the A-Trans shot does minimal damage. You need to deliver the killing blow with this shot in order to to activate it, which can be quite time consuming. If you pull it off though, you'll get to use what I honestly believe is the next evolution of the Mega Man moveset, stealing abilities from not just bosses, but from your enemies too. You know, ignoring that Kirby's been doing this for years, and even other Mega Man in the series have been doing this. Also, Mega Man Zero a couple years from now would do it way, way better than this game ever could. I it's not great. In fact, I'd go to say that with how it's implemented in this game, that it's just downright terrible. Though a lot of that hangs from how the game feels. It's just slow and clunky, and you're never really really better off using this. You only need to use this a couple times when going for 100%, and even then it's very infrequent. Regardless of the dimensions you're traversing, you're able to use R2 to switch targets with possibly the most annoying audio cue you could imagine, and you can only swap targets in a linear order, so if you swap past the target you want, you need to cycle all the way back around the long way. You need to use this target swap mechanic to open this door here, firing at each of the targets when they turn pink. This door wasn't here in the pre-release demo for the game. Imagine being one of the poor souls who played that demo and then played the full game and thought, oh my god, a new door! Oh, what I'd give to be you. Axel escapes the unnamed facility, monologuing that he's lost somebody, presumably Red Alert. They're not telling us a lot here, and before you have a chance to ask what the hell he's running from, hey, look, it's a giant fucking mechanoloid! How will Axel make his way out of this one? That's okay, I didn't want to know either. In the moment, Zero shows up to the scene, confused why he needs to return to the same highway from X1. A rather meta commentary about the game, if you ask me. Though I'm more confused about how deep his voice is above all else. How did we go from... to this? I can't believe I'm back here again. What the heck has happened? They really made up a mess. Dude must have hit triple puberty when he hit himself to repair himself. I know that the returning setting and enemies is pure nostalgia pandering, likely born from lack of inspiration, but I'd, I'd be lying if I said it didn't tickle my fancy. I do genuinely love seeing these environments and enemies in 3D. You know, ignoring that Maverick Hunter X would do it way better. But in an idea that I think sounds absolutely incredible in concept, we're here with Zero with his saber. Something that I dreamt of since I was a mere zygote. <laughs> Yeah, it fucking sucks. Remember controlling Zero in the PS1 trilogy? How his saber came out mere frames after hitting the attack button? It made his playstyle rewarding to those with quick reflexes. Meanwhile, X7 has absolutely none of that. They gave his saber a fucking wind-up that you need to commit to. There is no fast-paced action with Zero in this game. He is a stationary, heavy hitter, and nothing else. This is made even worse when you try to use a saber mid-air. Look at all of those frames of downtime. Holy shit. Who approved this? This isn't to say that Zero's all bad. His saber is able to deflect projectiles right off the bat, which hey, that's pretty cool if the windup didn't make the timing so tricky. And they gave him a fourth slash to his hoo ha ho combo. <laughs> So that, that's pretty nice. We're not gonna use that full combo for the B-Bladers though, since you could just stand directly under it and spam your first slash with good timing. <laughs> Oh what, you think this three-dimensional camera is gonna keep me from exploiting this game wide open? 
Yes, I know that I'm clipping inside of it, why do you ask? One Crusher segment later and our hunters finally cross paths. Axel, who's still fleeing the massive mechanoloid, is stopped by Zero, suspicious of the guy as expected, but before he can make any accusations stick- What are you talking about? Oh, here it comes. So I'll be seeing ya! Oh my god, they didn't even animate the rest of his body looking up. Oh, but Zero just broke his spine trying to see it. What the hell? What's going on? Yeah, me too, bud. Oh my god, it's a fucking auto-scroller segment. Why would you put an auto-scroller in your first level of a Mega Man game? I mean, at, at least I could practice Zero's projectile deflect, but uh, why would I ever use this outside of this opening level? I'm Axel. Call me if you need a hand. Our hunters finally shake hands to take down the Mega Scorpio Mechanoloid sent to retrieve Axel after his defection from Red Alert. So it's only fitting that we swap to Axel using Extreme 2's returning hunter swap mechanic, and totally not because using Zero against a boss fight is a fucking lost cause. If I could say one thing, I think that the idea of targeting specific parts of a boss to shoot them off is a good idea on paper, but because targeting a part of the boss is a mere click of the shoulder button, it's less of a skill requirement than really anything. It just makes the boss kinda pathetic, you just gotta target the head, spam projectiles, and there you go, you won. The team destroys Mega Scorpio, but due to the circumstances, Axel is taken into custody by Zero and sent to Hunter HQ. And while Zero is unfazed by Axel's desire to join the Maverick Hunters, it's our old friend X who's quick to shut him down, going as far to blame Axel for the destruction caused by Red's Mechanoloid, which is kinda fucked up, isn't it? It's like blaming an abuse victim for their abuser. X, what the hell did they do to you, man? Axel, of course, insists that they need his help. Red Alert has become nothing but a gang of murderers, he cries, but X just doesn't care. But before the plot can resolve its story naturally, with well-written characters and glimpses of humanity, just kidding, this is X7, the hunters receive a transmission from the leader of Red Alert, Red. What a name. According to the Japanese soundtrack booklet, he was a survivor to the Repliforce War from X4. It's a shame that the game does literally nothing with that info. Do you think that's why he's designed after the Grim Reaper, because that's how Sigma looked in that game? Yeah, probably not, that's a bit too deep. He demands the hunters return Axel to him like he's a fucking slave or something, but then also offers them a challenge. Defeat his eight captured Mavericks that he willingly releases back into the wild, and he'll give up Axel. Yeah, I don't really understand what this is supposed to solve to them, but whatever, we, we need an excuse for a game. Axel, understandably, is ridden with guilt. He believes that he can repent his sins by joining the hunters to take down Red and his mavericks. If you had just gone back, the problem would have been solved, but I can see that won't be happening. Oh my god, even Cygnus is in on it! Also, Cygnus is voiced by composer Robert Belgrade, you know, the guy who voiced Alucard in Symphony of the Night. What's wrong with you? So you are the one called Shaft. This time our only choice is to fight. Zero, thankfully, is willing to take Axel under his wing, being the closest thing to a reasonable person in the room right now. Jesus Christ, come on, man. These aren't the same characters that I loved growing up. Remember the ending to X1 where X monologues that he would fight for peace till the very end? Man, what happened to that guy? It's not like he went through character development. This is Mega Man X. I always saw X as this Superman character, not someone who needs to grow but is a god walking amongst men. Okay, Okay, that's a little dramatic. My point is that he's a man of infinite potential and needs to be a force for good. He's not Goku. He doesn't need to train constantly and change his entire personality. How the hell did this script even get approved? Whatever, let's just go save the game. Do I want to save the game? Yes, I want to save the game. Why isn't yes selected by default? Yes, I want this profile too. Why is yes not selected by default? Jesus Christ. All right, can I go back to the stage select now? Go back to stage select. Oh my god! The stage select needs a little introduction. Still, I'll say that it's the best it's looked since X4. The spinning parts on the outside remind me of the inner workings of a watch, or at least how they're portrayed in movies. Granted, because of the HD upscaling of the Legacy Collection, the 2D assets do look abnormally blurry. The music is pretty good, though. And that's something that I will gladly say about the whole game. The soundtrack here, in my opinion, is at least on par with X6, maybe a little below it. Not every track in the game was created equally though, literally. There's upwards of nine composers credited for this game. This track was composed by Shinya Akata, who composed two other tracks for the game, including the Mega Scorpio fight. After selecting your mission, you're given a choice of which hunters you'd like to bring along for the ride. I'm not sure why this is at this point of the game right now though. It's not like you have a third character to choose from until you unlock X, which isn't gonna happen for a long time, but whatever. With semantics out of the way, let's go subdue some runaway mavericks.
the tunnel base, an underground military facility below eastern Canada. This is one of the few stages with a 3D camera from beginning to end, including the boss, and is the only mission of the main eight to give us the Gowden ride armor, which you can easily miss by not checking your corners. It's fun, genuinely, and we'll be getting more use out of it later in the level. We're still gonna exploit this game a bit, like how you can gain an extra sliver of height when using Zero's jump slash immediately after using his double jump. You're supposed to destroy this wall before you can wall jump over it, but with Zero, we can just... Yeah. Every stage is cut into halves like an X4, divided up with loading screens which were way worse in the original PS2 release. We get the Raiden 2 ride armor at the beginning of the second half here and we're gonna be taking it to the very end of this section for a little secret. Yes, the Raiden 2, the successor to the Raiden ride armor from the PS1 trilogy. Now with a physical drill arm rather than a laser drill like it had before. The spider legs are pretty cool, doesn't add anything to the gameplay though, they're purely cosmetic. And both new ride armors have their own normal and special moves. Relax, this ain't no Smash Brothers. Each attack has their own variant when used in the air or while dashing. Sadly, the Raiden 2's only worthwhile move is this neat explosive AoE that you can use in the air. They can tread down these turret walls pretty quick though, that's pretty cool. Aesthetically, it reminds me a lot of Mega Man Legends, a much better take on a 3D Mega Man game. We'll, we'll look at that one eventually. We're also able to heal with the ride armor by saving Reploids with it. Yes, Reploids are back and need saving like in X5 and X6, and are made even more infuriating as a collectible now that they can die permanently from any hostile attack. Yeah, that shit sucked back in X6, but at least they could only die to the nightmares. But here, there's some Reploids that you will miss permanently for simply not being fast enough, and that's, that's kind of bullshit. Ready? As long as you've brought the right in two to this final arena, you're good, you can die with it if you need to. Simply by bringing it to this final room, the game drops a Gowden armor off for you, and we're gonna be using that all the way to the boss fight. But first, we got some collecting to do. There's a sub tank up on these upper pillars, and Gordon, can't forget about him. I'm fighting the urge so bad. You have to kill all the enemy ride armors to get the boss to show up. Originally, you had to save 16 captive Reploids, presumably back when rescuing them was more of a mission gimmick rather than a constant across the whole game. Oh, what could have been. You figure, Axel. Oh boy. Vanishing Gungaroo, a reploid that's fully embraced the boxing kangaroo trope that we've seen so much in pop culture over the, what, last 140 years? 130, something like that. He's got a ride armor of his own, appropriately fitting him like a young kangaroo sits in its mother's pouch. Hey, did you know that a baby kangaroo is called a kid? But you're acting like a kid right now. Don't call me a kid! I hate this game. I really wish I didn't enter this boss fight with Axel because now I have to deal with Len Hart's very awkward line delivery from two different characters. I'm sure she's a fine voice actress when given a game with better direction. Look, every voice actor in this game is kinda shit. I don't really blame them at that point. I think that that's more the fault of the director. Now, what do you think his favorite shape is? Triangle. He's trying to say triangle kick, but is being cut off. I imagine the line in the Japanese version was shorter and this is just an oversight. I underestimated how tricky this guy would be on hard mode. Normally you could just take the Gowden right armor here and just shoulder tackle him to death, essentially a one cycle, but that didn't fucking work. Luckily Axel has a very, very generous dodge roll activated by double tapping the dash button, which renders him practically invulnerable, and for whatever reason, also lets him aim at whatever enemy is closest to him regardless of direction without any penalties. Just turn on auto fire and mash the dash button and you've essentially already won. Eventually he'll go down and you'll realize why everyone cites the boss fights as being one of the worst parts of this game. The first boss you fight has so much goddamn health and you are so fucking weak that it's ridiculous. Thankfully from here on, that won't be too much of a problem. X7's difficulty curve is kind of the opposite of what you'd expect. It starts high and then gets really low. After a fair game of Dark Souls later, Axel is rewarded with Explosion, a special weapon that turns this game into a bit of a joke. Now, it's not as trivializing as Mega Man 2's Metal Blade, but <laughs> I mean, what is? Okay, it's not actually the special weapon itself, though it is pretty good. My cat is tearing up my chair. Explosion, the only special weapon in the series that only has one word in it, is the special weapon for both X when we unlock him, as well as Axel. But Axel gets a bonus for a majority of the special weapons available, modifying his normal non-special attacks in a way that doesn't drain from his special weapon pool. And here, he's granted the G-Launcher. This thing is just a smack to the face for bosses. It shreds through their health with ease and levels the playing field for the player from here on. Don't worry though, this isn't an Extreme 2 situation where only the hunter that deals the finishing blow gets the special move. Zero is still granted the Handageki, a move that I only remember the name of because of Marvel vs. Capcom. With our first boss defeated, we get to see what the deal is with rescued Reploids and the new parts system. And if it weren't for them being as fragile as Zero's love life, I'd say that this is the best that they've been implemented so 
far. Actually, no, I still feel that way about the X series. Rather than Reploids granting you specific parts and perks depending on which Reploid you rescue, now select Reploids offer you upgrade discs. These can be used to level up various stats, rewarding us with parts that we knew from the previous couple games as you build up these specific stats. I like to build Zero as my glass cannon boss killer who I use to brute force bosses and then swap to Axel in the last minute if he's about to die. Cause in X7, if one of your hunters dies, they both die for some reason. I don't know what the deal is with that. I typically build Axel for just powering through the level because his G-launcher really doesn't need much more buffing. Very soon though, we'll max out Zero's special stat, allowing for bonus damage when using a special technique against bosses. It, it gets kind of busted. The overarching story of X7 is delivered to us in a rather convoluted way. After completing each mission, we're given a back and forth between Zero and Axel, bonding as the game progresses, and dip feeding us dip. <laughs> Drip feeding us Axel's backstory. Like how Axel has no idea where he got his A-trans ability from. Putting the pieces in place for a mystery to be solved? Never. At least not in this game. These little lore snippets are really short, and it would feel really disjointed if I were to go over them as they appear in the game, so I'm gonna go over them all at once because it really doesn't matter in the context that they're shown. The faction of Red Alert once held itself to a standard, skilled but moral hunters that took over once X retired, until everyone involved grew more and more violent, no longer following Red's orders. It's got something to do with his DNA, Axel says. Red took samples of his DNA and with it grew stronger. Eventually Axel left feeling like he was being used for some unknown agenda. The group had changed. Wait, holy shit, is Axel about to propose? Oh man, I'm so happy for them. Turns out Red had been working for Sigma all this time. Uh, at least I think. I don't know when this takes place. Oh, I'm sorry, the professor. I can at least appreciate the attempt, or lack thereof, to not even give a shit about hiding the professor's identity. I don't even know who the heck you are. Literally Literally how. Red Alert had been compromised, and Sigma seems to be simping over Axel now, to say the least. I can only imagine that he wants Axel's DNA slash A-trans ability for himself, and offers Red a taste of its potential. Potential that could only render a Reploid invincible. Yeah, that sounds like a Ponzi scheme to me, very cliche. Red doesn't seem to be having it though, almost like he's unaffected by Sigma's influence or Maverick virus. But when the purple guy's silver tongue is lacking, brute force is soon to follow, using clones of Red's captured Mavericks to keep him at bay. And that's all we get in until we beat all eight bosses. Yeah, this isn't really the best story when you lay it out back to back like this. There's clearly the setup for some kind of plot MacGuffin inside Axel's DNA, but that's never really resolved in this game. A shame because I do genuinely love Axel's character here, even if he's a bit annoying. All right, now where were we? Central Circuit, the game's one and only ride chaser mission. I know folks give this level a lot of shit for putting you in charge of your own speed, and it's totally deserved, but I don't think it's that bad. You can still go fast if you want to, and I do if I miss a bomb and have to take another lap around the circuit. Yeah, we're collecting bombs some fuckass left on the freeway, that reverse jet stingray, saving reploids and collecting shit along the way. Oh shit, I missed Scott. It's okay, Scott, I came back for you. It, it's really short. It doesn't overstay its welcome, in my opinion. The most I've got to say is that it's a bit of a hassle to tell the rescuable Reploids and Runner Bombers from each other. I would start my X7 runs with this level if it weren't for the G-Launcher being as busted as it is. Speaking of... Oh, thank Christ, just in time. Hey, Honcho, I'm here to defeat you. Who are you? Red gave you a home and this is how you repay him? You worthless upstart! Dude, your breathing's getting heavy. Calm down. Anyway, in a way, this is exactly how I'm repaying Red. Who oh, are you, brat? I ought to take the light. Jesus Christ, this is supposed to be Mega Man, not Zelda for the CDI. At least Borski is an interesting fight, though still quite annoying on the ears. Unfortunately, or fortunately in this case, he is absolutely shredded by the G launcher. Even explosion does some great damage to him. Remember, this isn't even his weakness, this is just raw damage. I've only got enough juice to use explosion once, though. No way! <laughs> I'm also convinced that the team saw the crash rotor enemies from X2, the head of a boar on wheels, and thought, hey, we could turn that into a boss, and then just made him a transformer. Surprisingly, only the third Transformers boss in the series up to this point. They could have also found out that Harley Davidson bikes are sometimes called hogs. I don't know, this guy's either a pun or a dumbass. Ah shit, it looks like I missed a Reploid. Well, let's load back up into Borski's stage and... 
Oh my fucking lord, why can't I skip the dialogue in this godforsaken game? But we finally got Tanaka, and with his chip, I will make my zero grow. All right, is it Tunyon time? I think it's Tunyon time. Yes, Tornado Tunyon, a boss modeled after a fucking onion, which would be way more ridiculous if we didn't already have Wire Sponge. The Radio Tower is a take on those spiral staircase levels from X4 and X5, though here it's the entire stage, a straight linear walk while being pursued by Yotakari, a hermit crab mechanoloid. If you're a veteran to the series, you'll know that we won't get a chance to damage this guy until we get to the midpoint of the stage, excused in story by Alia trying to find a weak point on it. Yeah, just try to stay on your toes though, cause if you don't... God damn it. Analysis complete. The head is its weak point. Gee, thanks, Alia. No way I could have figured that out on my own. Yotakari is a lot like the rest of this game. Quite easy, just a slog. There's only a couple of attacks that you need to watch out for, but his vulnerability window is pathetically short. If you have bad RNG, you're going to be waiting around for a lot of this fight. Alright, we've got a whole half of the stage left and no mechanoloid to make chase. I wonder what it's gonna throw at me in exchange. Alright, disappearing blocks would be much worse if I didn't have a wall jump. I know that we had them in X5 too, but at least those were spaced out to accommodate for it and remain a challenge. You will need bounding. What a pain. Yeah, hey Alien, what the fuck does that mean?! Around and around! Oh my god, okay. Annoying fucking voice aside, which I'm starting to see a pattern of, I do genuinely like this guy's design. The whole robot thing with floating limbs with a big spike where the elbows would be, it's just a neat trope that appeals to that childhood-like wonder that I can't let go of. This boss, though, is what catalyzed me to run this game with auto-fire on. You have to shoot at his juicy center to deal damage, protected by onion layers that act as shielding, and you need to blast that shielding off if he's not attacking you. Just keep your distance, he's not really that threatening. The worst you get is him attacking your frame rate directly with his Volt Tornado. Don't bother fighting him with zero, just keep rolling with Axel like we did with Gungaroo repeatedly for about five minutes. Yeah, fuck this guy, I'm just here for his special technique. <laughs> No, no, I, I really didn't. Volt Tornado for X and Axel is just okay, but Zero's technique, once we max out his special stat, turns him into a real force to be reckoned with. I have essentially just beaten X7, and now it's just a waiting game. Hey, remember that Battleship movie, a film based off of the tabletop game? Yeah, this is actually nothing like it, I just wanted to remind you that that film existed and that we didn't mutually dream of its existence. And much like the film, this stage has possibly the laziest miniboss I've seen in the entire series. Fighter Aircraft. Yes, that, that is its name. It doesn't even animate. It's just a spinning statue of a jet craft that you can knock out with a couple of volt tornadoes. I, I can only imagine that the initial idea for this mini boss was too ambitious for the team and this is what they settled on, but the concept art doesn't imply much for the guy aside from the aircraft having an afterburner. Maybe it was supposed to fly around at one point? I don't know, but it, it doesn't. With the destruction of fighter aircraft, the battleship has begun to sink itself, hoping to take us down with them. Now tell me, were these Uduboros here before or after it went down? Alright, that's not entirely true. These aren't the same Ouroboroses from X1. Ouroboro, Ouroborai. Uh, they're certainly inspired by them. I, I do really love the dragon head. That's pretty cool. Just hit him with a couple of Volt Tornadoes or just projectile spam. Th they're not too tough. <laughs> Holy shit, another Transformer! Ah, it's a headmaster. All right, you're never gonna guess what this fucker is named. All right, you ready for it? I don't think you are. Humanoid Bridge. Yep, that that's cool. You don't attack the bot directly, you just have to take out the turrets that rotate around him. His most dangerous attack is his fireballs, which you can easily avoid with Axel's dodge roll. Oh my god, they couldn't even animate him falling apart without it looking bad. They just grabbed the limb bones and pulled them down the Z-axis. Holy shit is that lazy! After an incredibly short side-scrolling section with multiple other bots from X1 given a fresh coat of paint, again, really neat designs if it weren't for the game that they're in, we make it to Splash Warfly, with Humanoid Bridge laying in the background and really standing out because of the attempt of fog in the distance that looks genuinely fucking terrible. <laughs> 
Ironically, despite this attack being his weakness, he's one of the handful of bosses that isn't immediately cheesed by Zero's Raijin show, the tornado uppercut we just got from Tunyon, if only because it is actually his weakness. When he's hit with it, he retreats back into the seas. It's really safe, it's just really slow. You gotta give it time. Water laser isn't the worst special weapon to get for X and Axel. It'll be especially helpful for right armor bots that we'll be seeing in the fortress, even though I don't use it. Wind Crow Ring. Is that like a sex thing? The first half of Air Forces sucks from what I like to call Crash Bandicoot Syndrome. I can barely fucking tell where I'm about to land when platforming between these ships, but they are color-coded at least. Blue ships are stationary platforms, green ships move between two points, be it up or down or back and forth, and red ships transition you to the next part of the level, sometimes. The geometry of these planes are a nuisance. You are unable to jump while the green jets are moving down, and for whatever reason, while jumping on them from the side just feels like a losing battle. I I've really don't blame anyone who dropped this game because of the stage. It's really bad. Holy shit, Gorilla on the plane! Where is he going? The duo makes it to the access point to the heart of the warship, which we <laughs> just learned existed. We gotta take out the cannons to get access, which you could just shred with a Volt Tornado or two. But remember to save the Reploids in this area before taking out the mini boss that follows because you are forced into the next area when you do. Hey birdie, I'm not just saying that because you look like a bird, that's actually what your name is. Honestly, I think that this design could have worked as a pretty competent main Maverick design, but hey, whatever, mini boss is fine, I guess. Ready? For what it's worth, I like the interior of the ship. Very nice colors, the over-the-shoulder camera is pretty cool, it kinda makes me think that the game should have been designed for this. It's kind of oddly fitting for the run-and-gun style that they tried to make for this. This isn't like you, cooped up in a place like this. I thought you'd fly straight at me, of course! <laughs> Yep, th this sure is a boss fight. I wrote in my notes questioning how this got past QA, but honestly, with the rest of the game, this isn't even close to being a concern. Yeah, I don't know why he does this. Sometimes he'll just sit there completely invulnerable and just caw at you. I, I don't know what the deal is. The most threatening thing he does is just sit in the background and throw these boomerangs at you. Yeah, aside from the setting of this boss possibly being a reference to Storm Eagle, I, I don't have much. At this point though, I had finally crossed the threshold. With enough Reploids rescued, a cutscene is triggered. Aelia is delighted that Axel and Zero have been saving Reploids, but the team is still far from being capable of taking down Red's forces. Which doesn't make any sense, but whatever. X has finally come to his senses, kind of, saying that the Hunters can't overcome Red Alert without his help, and finally joins his peers in battle. Zero couldn't really give a rat's ass though. Okay, do as you please. Reminder, these guys are supposed to be best buds. I'm gonna blame this one on the lack of direction though. But hey, maybe he's onto something because X right out of the gate isn't good. That wouldn't be true if you could start the game with him. But because we've rescued a majority of the Reploids in the game, he's got no upgrades and doesn't really have room to upgrade for this playthrough. You're not gonna get much use with X outside of a New Game Plus playthrough where you can upgrade him from the get-go. I'll be talking about that later on in this video. The rest of this playthrough is going to be exclusively Zero and Axel. You can also unlock him by beating all eight bosses, which which gives you even less room to upgrade them. Deep Forest, the only fully 2D stage of the main eight. No, Alex, wait! Who killed Captain Alex? Oh god, the vine booms get out of my head! The deep forest is a stage that I dread completing. You need the DNA from these ruinsmen to walk over spikes to save every reploid. But these ruinsmen are so fucking tanky. So on one side, these guys are passive reploids. They won't attack the player unless they're provoked. And there's a giant variant later on in the stage with the same amount of health points as the smaller grunts. Which makes me question, was the giant version intended to be the only version of these guys running around, had their models and values forked into a separate enemy, shrunk it down, and then their health values just weren't changed? Or was it human error? Were these smaller versions the only version originally, someone went to create a giant version of them, and then somehow applied the same health and damage values to both 
both of them. Regardless, this guy takes fucking forever to a trans with Axel's copy shot. It is absurd how long it takes and is made even worse by how fucking weak the copy shot is. This, this isn't good. I mean, their design is cool. Again, it reminds me of Mega Man Legends. I guess that was just the hot thing around Capcom at the time. Yes, I see you. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Ready? Oh, oh no, the council. Oh, oh, why does he have a detailed reploid ass? And why the nipples? Stone Kong is at least self-aware enough to know that Red's being manipulated by not Sigma, but he's too blinded by his shitty perception of loyalty to do anything about it. Again, implying that being labeled a maverick isn't always just a virus. Yeah, what's he offering you, Stone Kong? Dental? Eye care? Just remember to run left as soon as the fight starts. All right, maybe dodge roll instead. Hard mode doesn't let me rise and show spam this guy to death. I still end up using a lot of Zero's health bar as much as I can and just tanking it. He'll jump into the background a few times where you could still hit him with Axel. And there's normally a lot more to this fight, except you can break his sword, which I did without even meaning to, which neuters a good amount of his moveset. The Cyberfield, another entirely 3D mission. I remember being taken aback by a level taking place in cyberspace, like how did these physical beings end up getting here? But X4 did the same thing with Cyber Peacock, so whatever. That said though, what the fuck does sniping have to do with cyberspace? And while we're at it, what the fuck does an onion have to do with a radio tower? Nope, nope, never mind. it's too late for that. We got a lot of silver samurais here that Axel needs to A-trans to pass through these walls to save reploids, which still feels awkward to control, much like a lot of the copy abilities, but it's also kinda neat. I don't know, it's like a copy ability that I don't hate in this game. This level is really short though, and I have a feeling that that's because half of the stage was ripped out of the game late into production. If you watch the trailers for X7, there's a scene of a player running through the inside of a tube, which I'm pretty sure was supposed to be part of this level. I imagine like many other ideas that was just too ambitious for the team at the time, and led to the first half of this level being able to be completed in less than a minute. Man, I'm starting to feel kind of bad for the team here. They either just weren't up for it, or they just weren't given enough time. The second half of the stage still calls back to that cut segment, I think, having you jump jump into these lights over orange hexagons that bring you to the underside of the map. It's an interesting idea for sure, but I, I really hate the camera orbit it does every time you jump into these. This looks identical to taking a 3D camera and only give it four motion keyframes. Here I brought it into Source Filmmaker and I think I was able to recreate it perfectly. Okay, not really. This part is still confusing as fuck to navigate, and really sucks to 100%. The controls are only kind of flipped, up is down and down is up, but left and right are still the same, which, yeah, makes sense, it's just really awkward for me. There's looping text in the background of Japanese Morse code that repeats the words let's go, I'm gonna take care of you, I'm sorry, and above all else, professor. The latter making sense, I have no idea what the rest of this was supposed to imply. Maybe early stages of a story that uh, didn't happen. Oh, so you've come, little one. Isn't it about time for your retirement? <laughs> this one is a big talker. Shouldn't you concentrate on being granted hunter status? Aw, oh, man, you always were good at figuring people out. Oh, yes. I take it back, the line delivery in this game is perfect. Snipe Anteater is a bit of a bullet hell, kinda like double an X4 if you don't destroy his drones when using his weakness. The fight takes place on the outside of a cylinder, except you can't run around it, you can only traverse the top half of it. At least, you can't. He can still go all over it. And credit where it's due, this is a boss that couldn't really exist in the 2D games without cutting some major corners. It would be way cooler if I had full 3D movement around the cylinder though. You can send out the wheel moves that you got from Ride Borski around the cylinder to hit him on the other side. It's not really worth it though, I just use Rise and Show. We get the sniper missile from the sky, a weapon I, I never used. Alright, what's next? Oh, 
Oh, God help us. A lava factory, because in 21XX, we need a fucking factory to make that shit. I want to know the geoscience implications of this world needing a lava factory. What the fuck? This level is fine. Honestly, if it weren't for the boss at the end, I'd say that this is one of the safest levels in the game. It was much less linear in the pre-release demo, with an objective of destroying 30 enemy targets in under 5 minutes, which I believe was recycled into Gungaroo's stage with the right armors. There is still a bomb mechanic that will kill some reploids if you're not fast enough, like that shit from the Skyver stage back in X5, except even worse. It's not terrible, though. We got some more Udoburoses here that you can absolutely shred with the water laser. It's not really much until you get to the second half. You gotta be careful, though, otherwise these spinning radio towers will stun lock you into the lava below. You can A-trans these jetpack dudes to fly across the map if you want. There is an E-tank down here, you don't need the jetpack guy. I realize I should have brought up that collectibles don't have any sort of sound or feedback for collecting them, otherwise someone in the comments is gonna have a fucking field day. Yeah, this didn't bother me as much as other creators, if I'm being honest. It's still dumb, don't think that I'm excusing it. I've played this game more than I'd like to admit, and even today I'll still be surprised when I notice that I have a sub-tank in my inventory that I picked up back in Warfly stage that I don't even remember grabbing. It's stupid, I don't know how this got past QA, but it's not as offensive as the rest of the game. It's more of a nitpick to me personally. Oh, that can't be a good omen. Don't worry, I am just a cure. God, uh, Axel, your thumb is clipping through the gun. Warning! Warning! Can you hear me, Axel? Uh -oh. Good lord, what were they thinking with this guy? So from the get-go, Hyenard is able to clone himself with no surface level indicators of which is actually the real him. Though if you have to know, the real one is sitting atop the giant mech that's walking circles around the arena. This is a concept that I don't hate. You can bring down his mech pretty quick by blasting the limbs with water lasers, and you even have a small window to punish the real Hyenard where he stands with Ryzen Show while it's leveled. Just don't do this once the mech starts walking around because you will fall off, and that lava is insta-kill. But once you make it to the middle of the mech, him and his clones decide that it's time for you to swallow his entire hyena cock. I, I, I don't like what I just said. If you try to leave their circle, they will bully you back into the middle. They'll throw fireballs, dash at you, and blast your fucking ears out with how often he shouts at you. Burn to the ground! Burn to the ground! Burn to the ground! You could cheese this guy if you've got Warfly's staff for zero. Just lunge it at the right one and you'll get him in a loop. It's just a case of the boss being really easy once you know what to do, but that that's not an excuse. That's what this whole series has been built around. Even with that, this boss fight fucking sucks. All right, we are finally through the worst of it until we get to the fucking boss rush. With all eight of Red's Maverick slain, Red reveals his palace to the hunters, willfully inviting them to his fortress, where presumably he's laid some kind of trap, I would hope. Though this new stage select theme, goddamn, is it beautiful. I just wish that it was longer than a fucking three second loop. Oh boy, more nostalgia pandering. Remember the mole bots from X1's armadillo stage? Imagine if that was the entire level and it's an auto scroller where you have to keep it on screen at all times. Try spinning, that's a cool trick. Speed. Yeah! Yeah, this stage is lame as hell, but it manages to not be too long. The weirdest part is that there's crash rotors here from X2, which is a really weird spot for them to be. I imagine that they were originally intended for Borski's stage, but for whatever reason, that just didn't work out. They managed to turn this mole bot into a full boss that you fight at the end of the stage, who, come on, isn't really that tough. He's arguably easier to kill here than he is in X1, and that was a recurring enemy in that game. Just set off an explosion inside of him that shreds most of his health down. Yeah, it's... <laughs> What the fuck was this? One endless highway later and Red's Crimson Palace is now available to us. You know, for a Crimson Palace, it sure is very purple. I sure hope that a massive boulder doesn't come down and impede my path. God damn it! These things hurt quite a bit, but you can still damage boost through them by tapping a nearby enemy and just running through them with your iframes.
Wait, are you kidding me? The only thing standing between you and the front doors of the Crimson Palace is just three boulders? Holy shit, Red, get your shit together. Axel finally confronts Red and oh my God, Zero Spear is clipping through X's arm. Uh, <coughs> Axel confronts Red, who doesn't let on that he's essentially being blackmailed into fighting us from the beginning because God forbid we have a story here. Morning. Morning. Oh, that's a large health bar. All right, I'll admit that this fight gave me more trouble on hard mode than usual, and I had to eventually leave to get more sub tank juice. The fight is over a bottomless pit, which makes it really easy to compare him to Gate from X6, but I think that's really where the similarities end. He'll teleport in, let you shoot at him a few times. Sometimes he'll fake you out with clones, but you don't even target them, so it's not like you should fall for it. He'll teleport around and vulnerable where he tries to hit you with a pink tornado, and that's really all he does. It can be hard to avoid his scythe beam sometimes, which is why I just kind of give up and and just tank the damage and heal myself, your worst enemy here is gonna be the camera, which is very much bullshit. If I could wrap this enemy up with a bow, I'd say, uh, don't deal the finishing blow to him while you're jumping in between platforms, because if you're in the middle of it, you're gonna go straight down like a rock and you will die, even if you kill him. You'll have to redo the boss fight there. It it's stupid, I know. You've really grown up, Axel. You hear that? This place is done for. I, <coughs> I set it to self-destruct. <coughs> in, in case of an emergency. No! Reg, you're coming with us! <laughs> I'm not sure why they're trying to redeem Red here. It already implies that he was a piece of shit before Sigma shows up, unless that cutscene we saw earlier was a flashback, which is totally possible. Again, the story here is merely a suggestion. I can't even say that this is an X6 situation where they had a good idea that just got muddled by whatever the fuck happened to that game. It really feels like there was only a surface level attempt at a story here that didn't really go much farther than that. And that's a shame. There's a lot of potential in Red as a character. Hell, I don't even think Axel is interesting in this game, but is made interesting because of how he's used in later games. It's just what this game sets up that I think is interesting. Yeah, this is the part where the water laser just shreds through these guys, but the, the shoulder tackle is fun. Ready? Whoa, holy shit! Unique wolf enemies that I, I can just walk around. <laughs> I, I need a minute. I do love this boss rush room though. The look of the coffins and I, what is that? Souls in the background combined with the somber music and presentation. It, it's genuinely good. It brings up darker implications for Sigma resurrecting these boss rush mavericks, which is a shame. Again, they don't really do anything with this until like three more games from now. Hey, have you ever heard of stunlocked kangaroo before? <laughs> Eight bosses with even larger health bars later, the team confronts the professor, I mean Sigma, the game's chain-smoking uncle who makes his return from X6. <laughs> so, it was you after all. X, why are you even remotely surprised? You never give up, do you? Even when we break you down. Zero, hey, come on, Sigma's eyes are up here. That's right, folks. I'll do it again and again. I will make X and Zero mine. Hey, that's pretty hot. Now please tell me he doesn't bring his Sunday best. Oh shit, he brought it! That's certainly not the worst Sigma fight ever. The music's pretty fucking awesome, and I like the setting. I don't get what the deal is with these Energon cubes, but hey, I, I don't need an explanation. Even with the extra health on hard mode, he's still not that hard. I like that he blocks shots with his rifle though. That's pretty goofy. Warning. Warning. 
Man, I never thought I'd see the day of Sigma becoming the size of the fucking moon. At least the music feels appropriate, albeit kind of absurd. But hey, I'm, I'm totally here for that sort of thing. Ready for the real thing. <laughs> this fight is broken apart once you realize that you could stand on these two platforms on the far left here and just jump between them to completely avoid all of his attacks. He'll shoot these green projectiles up into the air and you could just sit on the edge of the second platform and they just don't hit you. Even his laser cock can't reach you if it's firing at the bottom platform. Uh, that seems like a pretty big oversight there, dude. The only attack you need to worry about is Sigma's giant fist, which will launch you into the bottomless pit under the arena. Uh, essentially a one-hit kill by proxy. Concept art exists for additional flying Sigma heads that were supposed to be in this fight, possibly akin to his final form from X4. It's hard to say how far most of this made it into production because this boss fight really is just a glorified T-pose. Oh. This way! Hurry! I have no idea how the team made it back to the Crimson Palace after fighting Sigma in fucking space, or even why Sigma has his X6 design so quickly. Were we even fighting Sigma, or was this like a proxy thing? <laughs> Oh, okay, that must be the real Sigma if he could just punch Axel right through the fucking wall. I found you, Zero and X. <laughs> Very nice, friend. Give me your power. It's time for revenge. Oh, with this power, I'll, I'll never, never lose! Wait, what? Didn't Axel just shoot him like fucking 70 times? And then why does this one shot work? And how did it send him out the window? Hell, I'm surprised X and Zero didn't just get up and say, hey, good job, buddy, but did you really need to smack us around like that? After the pre-rendered FMV, we've got a bullshit system where the ending we get afterwards is dependent on who deals the final blow to Sigma. Axel's ending is him begging X to let him join the Maverick Hunters after proving himself, where X is still being a fucking bitch about it, getting after Axel for how eager he is to go Maverick busting, while in in the same breath saying that he never should have retired in the first place. God, I, I hate X in this game. As for the other endings though, we'll get to those in just a minute because I gotta slip into something more comfortable. And by more comfortable, I mean a uh, new game plus. Remember to turn on auto charge for X, something that I recommend keeping off when using Axel because it only affects his copy shot. When starting a fresh save, X is genuinely overpowered compared to Axel. Sadly, you can't bring him into the intro stage, so there's not really anything here. But of those main eight stages, he just tears the rest of the game apart. His charge shot, you know, the only defining feature when put side by side with Axel, is devastatingly powerful for the early game, capable of shredding enemies and bosses. The worst I really have to say about him is how whiny he is through the campaign. <laughs> Please, please stop whining! You may have also noticed these weird pod things around the stages when you play through them normally. Yeah, these are X's light capsules. It's an interesting look, but hey, it's nice that they're here. For whatever goddamn reason, you can't collect them when playing as the other hunters, which just really feels like needless padding, forcing you to come back later or with New Game Plus. If it wasn't for how much I genuinely enjoy the power trip of playing as X in New Game Plus, I'd be more upset about this. But having a fully powered X with all of these chips and armor pieces, it really starts to make the game feel like a Mega Man X game. It's amazing how much a simple, effective charge shot can change this shitty formula. Simply dashing left and right and firing charge shots at bosses activates that same part of my brain that I get when playing other X games. Why? Why did you lock him away for this long in the game? I mean, yeah, it's not a great Mega Man X game with this, but it's not bad. Honestly, if X was available from the get-go, I'd probably put this game above X3. But he isn't, and that's bad. Dr. Light isn't voiced in this game, and if I'm being honest, these armor pieces aren't too amazing on their own, but at least Dr. Light only tells me to take his feet once. The foot part allows X to glide, which yes, it looks really fucking goofy, but isn't too bad when it comes to what it offers to the gameplay. In the 2D sections, you could turn yourself on a dime, but in 3D, you have to awkwardly steer yourself, so it's it's not exactly equal. X and Stone Kong have this weird discussion about war, which makes me wonder if the writers just wanted to make their own Metal Gear at some point. I would have loved to see how that turned out. Do you think Juicy Ass can bloom on the battlefield? What took you so long? The Buster upgrade gives his charge shot these little stray bullets that orbit around it. I, I barely noticed how much this changed the damage output, but I mean, it, it looks cool at least. It's enough to knock these thick boys on their ass though. I never saw that when playing as Axel or Zero. Oh, it hurts! These symptoms, could it be 
X, how long have you been doing this? Come on, you should know this by now. I mean, I didn't know that the Maverick virus is supposed to hurt. I mean, is it the virus? Stokong didn't have a virus. <laughs> I know that Zero cried out in pain when the Wily sauce hit back in X4 in that flashback cutscene. Is that supposed to be the same thing here? The chest armor grants us the Giga Crush or Crash, sorry. Oh, and it also gave X nipples. That <laughs> it's not too amazing in this game. It's just another screen nuke, but these like basic ass particle effects engulfing the screen is just, <laughs> it's kind of lame. <laughs> Look at me! Look at me! I'm king of the mountain! Stop it! Stop it right there! Yeah, X, you, <laughs> you tell him, buddy. Dr. Light wanted to give us the helmet parts in person, whatever the fuck that means. Dude, you're not even a person anymore, so you either made this while you were still alive, or your AI is bugging the fuck out. It's a vacuum perk. It attracts pickups towards you, which is actually pretty neat when you pair it with the fourth special perk for X, which makes enemies drop more health and ammo. Surprisingly, there is potential here for some kind of comboing perk system that I would genuinely love to see in a future game. That, uh, I know that won't happen anytime soon, though. X is able to snipe the snipe ant eater from around the cylinder, which is pretty cool, no pun intended. I'm sure Axel could do this too, but I, I really don't care. So you're the big cheese. Yeah, I, I got nothing. This game's perfect. Oh, I didn't know that you could shoot the front of his crusher off. Oh God! Red is still pretty fucking annoying. I had to go through a couple of sub tanks just to make it through, but I, I, I did it. Done. All right, bald daddy, where you at? Uh, I gotta refill my health real quick. Hold on. Why am I allowed to do that? Is this the first time in the series they put a checkpoint between the final boss phases? That That's really fucking sad. Kind of defeats one of the things I love about these bosses in Mega Man games, like having to do all of the final boss phases in a single life. Whatever, this game isn't a challenge. <laughs> X's ending is kind of dark with its implications. The rise of all these Mavericks showing up has caused a riot at an unnamed power plant, where then Mechanoloids showed up, which Axel was able to stop, but people fucking died. I mean, hey, with Axel, less people died than expected. But X, you know, after defeating Sigma in space, scolds Axel for going in and stopping it. I mean, at least Cygnus grows a backbone and tells X that, you know, he needed to be a hunter in this case. But then X just goes, no, Axel will never be a hunter. Ready. Yeah, that, that really didn't age well. Much like the last few games, Zero's ending is a lot more interesting. Zero has been having dreams, visions of X going rogue. An obvious foreshadow to the upcoming Zero series is what I thought when I saw this for the first time. Yeah, the first Zero game came out a year ago at the time this game came out. For those of you who didn't know, the real X was supposed to be the antagonist of the Zero series before eventually it was turned into a copy of X, which makes me feel like this ending was at least workshopped before the Zero game came out. You know, the real X turning rogue. It's just vague enough for it to work. I still have no idea where this fits in the timeline. After X6, it's safe to say that some of the endings don't take place immediately after the game. The next game to come after this was Command Mission, a full RPG that takes place during the same time that the Zero games would normally take place, but there isn't a Neo Arcadia, implying a split timeline. I was always under the impression that X7, X8, and Command Mission took place in their own timeline, and that it was the Zero ending in X6 that led to the Zero games being canon, but I don't know. Doing these videos after this long has made me realize that the Mega Man canon isn't nearly as cut and dry as I thought it was. Yeah, X7 is a mess, and I, I really don't blame anyone for preferring X6 over this game when it comes to comparing two different types of turds, but I'm honest when I say that I would rather play this game than X6. Now, please don't take that as me saying I think that this game is good. I'm just saying that I think X6 is worse. It's slow, but it's not frustrating in my opinion. However, when I say that, I'm coming from a different perspective that I think the casual gamer is. I'm someone who likes to play a game all the way through and collect everything whenever I revisit a game. And because of how bullshit X6 can be, even though some of the exploits are genuinely fun, it's not a game that I love to finish, but I usually have the patience to beat it. And I think that the power trip offered with New Game Plus, which is typically how I replay it, is a lot more fun. I'm sure I won't be able to change anyone's mind about this, but I mean, I, I just want this out there, you know? Regardless of what you think of either of those games, I can at least say that we are through the thick of it for the most part. And next time we come back with the Mega Man series, it'll be with Mega Man X Command Mission. Yes, this will be a completely different type of game from the other X games, but hey, maybe it'll be a breath of fresh air. And until next time, guys, I will see you then. Breaking, breaking away.